text to give is our quickest and simplest way to give using your credit card or bank card. All you need to do is text 610-285-1866 with the amount of your gift and note whether it is your tithe, offering, or other. For example, 100 tithe or 100 offering or 100 other. If it is your first time using text to give you will be prompted to either create a new account or give anonymously. Creating a new account makes future gifts more convenient and less time consuming. In addition, you will receive email receipts. Good evening, House on the Rock Family Church. I am Reverend Russell. I am here to uh, just present God's Word to you this evening. I'm so glad to be with you guys. Uh, We are going to be continuing our Imperfectly Perfect series. This will be part three, um, and I've titled it Doubter, okay? So Imperfectly Perfect, The Doubter, all right? Uh, Before we jump into it, uh, for all my note takers, uh, if you've got a pen, paper, pencil, paper, if you take notes on your cell phone, your iPad, if you've got an Apple Pencil, they're actually a lot of fun to use. So, But anyway, if you've got uh, something to take notes with, before we pray, I want you guys to write this down. I'm going to do something a little unorthodox or, or out of my normal, and I'm actually going to give you my main point first. Um, it's something that I hope that you focus on and you hold on to it as we're going through the the message tonight. But um, anyway, I'm rambling, so let's just do it, all right? My, my bottom line, my overall point is, is this for this evening, guys, is God's power to use us to do his will is greater than any doubts we have in ourselves or our ability to be used by God. All right, I'm going to say that one more time uh, for my note takers, or maybe you heard it, you're like, oh man, that's really good. I do want to write this down. Again, God's power to use us to do his will is greater than any doubts we have in ourselves or our ability to be used by God. Okay, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. Uh, let's pray. Father God, as always, I just thank you for the opportunity to be with our church family. Uh, whether they're watching this as it debuts this evening or uh, they're going back and rewatching it or somebody's catching it a month later, Father God, I thank you that you've ordained that. I thank you, Lord God, that what I have to say is your words and that they are perfect and pleasing, Lord God. I pray for softened hearts and open ears so that each and every one of us can receive what it is that you have for us today, this evening, today, this afternoon, whenever it is. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so like I said, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 1. But throughout the entire Old Testament, the nation of Israel is continuously or continually on a journey of getting close to God's will and then getting far outside as well. All right, throughout the entire Old Testament, the nation of Israel is one minute growing and going as close as they possibly can to God, and then the next minute they're stepping outside of his will. All right, and that's what I want to talk about uh, just a little bit this evening, not in full detail, because uh, I feel like we all can, can, can grasp that concept pretty well. But taking a look at Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, uh, we find that the nation of Israel in the book of Judges uh, has fallen away from their faith and our heavenly father. Uh, if I was God and I, and I, and I get it, uh, cause I'm a dad now, right? And, uh, my son is at the, the airing or taping of this, whenever you want to call it is eight months, soon to be nine months old. And he is self aware now, right? He's self aware. He's crawling. Uh, he's, he's talking. And when I say talking, he's babbling and, and, yelling at mom and dad for anything and everything he can, right? But I say that to say this, that there's oftentimes when we put him on the ground to crawl because we're still in awe of all of that, right? There's times where we have to redirect him and tell him, no, don't do that. And a lot of the times it winds up, we have to get up, go over to him, grab him, redirect him, and send him another way. And after about the third or fourth time, that gets very tiring, 
It gets very tiring, it gets very frustrating. No, I'm not saying that I'm tired of my son. No, I'm not saying that I'm overall frustrated. But I'm sure that you guys, if you've been parents or even uh, uh, dog parents, when you've got to constantly re uh, redirect and, and correct, it gets tiresome, it gets frustrating, right? And so again, we're, we're looking at the Old Testament and that's exactly what has happened. Uh, the Israelites have, have again fallen out of God's influences. And so God has allowed an outside region to uh, come in and, well, anyway, I, I may be jumping ahead of myself again. Judges chapter six, verses one through six says this, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever, excuse me, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished that the Israelites, that they cried out to the Lord for help. Okay, because of their actions, because of uh, God's people's actions, because of Israelites, the Israelites' actions, the nation of Israel had been overtaken by a foreign country that ran them to the mountains, had their food and crops, livestock taken from them, and left them essentially with nothing. Well, and you may be sitting there saying, well, okay, well, why is that such a big deal? Listen, let me break it down for you for a second. That would be the equivalent of your childhood bully or someone you don't like or just an overall bad person walking into your house, eating up all your food, kicking you out and saying, this is my house now. It's totally my house. Man, that would, I can't even say what that would be, all right? For in lamest terms, that would be terrible. That would be awful. I mean, how would you feel? If somebody just walked into your house, kicked you out, and took all your stuff, right? It sucks. It sucks. I'm sorry. I hope the word sucks doesn't offend anybody. But anyway, it was at this point that Israel came to their senses and began to cry out to God to save them from their oppression that they were experiencing. Guys, how many times do we step outside of God's will? Do we ignore the warnings that he gives us, sends up to us, sends up the bat signal to let us know, hey, don't do that. If we go do it. We catch some form of a spanking. And then after the repercussion, we want to go to God and say, Lord, Lord, help me, save me. Right? Guys, what if, what if, we were just obedient from the beginning. What if we just followed the expectation that God has laid out for us beforehand without it even getting there, right? And again, we're talking about the Israelites and this is their continuous behavior. I mean, how many times does someone have to walk into their own house, whoop their behinds, take all their stuff and send them crying to the mountains? How many times do we put ourselves in that situation and then we want to cry, oh, God, why would you let this happen? Or God, this and God, that. And listen, the reality is, is this. God isn't even the author of it. Listen, again, it's just like when we were kids and we were playing around with something hot and our parent would come in and say, hey, don't touch that. You're going to burn yourself. And we burn ourselves and then we want to be upset about it. Hmm. Again, they cried out to God because of all the oppression that they were experiencing. And so this is how Gideon came to be called by God. Well, Russell, how'd that come to be? 
Are you going to tell us about it? Yes, I am, John. I glad, I'm glad you asked that, and I hope that you're watching now, now that I called you out on that. But anyway, while Gideon was trying to hide food from the Midianites, God comes to him while he's threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press, okay? And he tells Gideon that he has a message to send to the Israelites. God goes to Gideon and says, Gideon, I want you to send a message to the Israelites. God's messenger tells Gideon that he is being sent to rescue the people of Israel from the Midianites. That's actually pretty awesome that God came to him, sent a messenger to him, and said, hey, look, Gideon, this is what I want you to do. This is what I need you to do. You are the only you that can handle this situation. You are the only you that I have equipped to take care of this for the Israelites. And right away, Gideon has doubt. Right away, Gideon has doubt. All right, his response is in verse 15. Okay, Judges 6, uh, jumping down to verse 15, and it says, But Lord... How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe, and, I'm at the, and I am the least in my entire family. He said, my clan is the weakest out of the whole tribe. So he said, my family, out of, out of all these groups of people, my family is, is the weakest and the least impressive, but out of all of the weakest and the least impressive, I'm the weakest and the least impressive. Huh. Gideon definitely did not have faith in himself, despite the fact that God said, hey, this is something that I want you to do. I've chosen you to go save the people. Hmm. Isn't it fortunate for us that God knows exactly who he's picking, and what he's going to do. And that's why he picks them. Hmm. God tells Gideon that he will be with him to save him. Save, excuse me, God will be with him to save the Israelites. But we see that Gideon needs God to prove himself on three separate occasions. Listen. I know that I just said, and it's, and it's in Scripture, that Gideon, right off the bat, doubts his abilities to go and do something for God. But right off the bat, the fact that my man questioned God or, or told God to prove himself, not once, not twice, but three times, that's a pretty brave individual to tell God, well, prove it. Prove. You know what? Let's just take a look, on, a look at it. On the first instance of Gideon asking God to prove himself, Gideon prepared a sacrifice of meat, bread, and broth. Gideon was instructed to put the meat and the bread on the altar and then pour the broth over it to soak the meat and the bread. The angel of God then touched its staff to the sacrifice and caused it to burn up completely. Okay, listen to this. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, paraphrase it however you want to. To his amazement, Gideon realized that the messenger really was from God, you think, and quickly began to follow the instructions that were given to him to help to save the Israelites. Well, Russell, why do we have to write that down? Because the next time God comes to you and instructs you to do something, I want you to remember Gideon. Plain and simple. All right, God instructed Gideon to tear down an altar to bow and to build a new altar to God. And this caused a lot of anger. All right, God told him, go tear this down and build it up in my image. Build this up for me. Build it up to me. And it caused a lot of anger amongst the Israelites. First of all, when I was putting this together and, and I was rereading it and, and, and taking notes, I thought to myself, I said, well, why are the Israelites mad about Gideon wanting to do this for God because, like, they just got their butts kicked. Like, it, it, again, if, if I got my butt stomped and then kicked out of my house and then I got to watch them eat up all my food, I mean, I'm really not going to 
question God on anything or at least the person that God has sent, all right? Again, that's just my personal outlook on it, all right? But again, it caused a lot of anger, a lot of upset amongst the Israelites, even to the point of them wanting to kill Gideon for what he had done. However, guys, I want you to understand that when you do things, when we're obedient or we're doing things in God's name, in my opinion and my experience, but again, I'm speaking for me. I'm not speaking for you. I'm not speaking for, for any other believer. My personal experience and my personal belief, any and every time you go to do something on behalf of the Lord and uh, there's oppression met there, God will always send somebody or some bodies to have your back, okay? So again, Israelites wanted to kill Gideon for, for doing what God had told him to do. And Gideon's father defended his actions and told the Israelites that if Baal was real, then he could defend himself. And soon after that, Baal was destroyed. Several nations gathered their armies in preparation to attack Israel. And again, Gideon needed God to prove that he was really going to keep his promise to rescue the Israelites. So again, it's not as... <laughs> it's not like God didn't just prove himself and then say, oh, okay, I believe you, God. Now I'll go do it. Da, 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 da. Right? God proves himself. And then not only does God prove himself, but then God has Gideon's father intervene for him because the Israelites, they was feeling salty. So they wanted to kill him. But again, God used Gideon's father to step in and to defend him so that what needed to take place could take place. And then here we are again. And Gideon wants God to prove himself once more. Guys, how many times do we have to do something and experience God's goodness, God's grace, God's protection, just overall God's godness, and then we still question him? We still say, well, you, you prove, you prove you who you are. <laughs> Why does God have to prove anything after he's, our, first of all, God shouldn't have to prove anything to begin with, but he's a good father. And so he says, okay, I will do this for you. But then we want more. Because because the, the, the first eye opener wasn't good enough, I, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, Judges chapter six, jumping all the way down to verse 36 through 40, says this. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. At least he had the common sense to say, all right, God, I know I'm pushing it, but please don't be mad at me. Can I, can I ask for one more thing? Okay. So anyway, let me just make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. That night, God did so. Only the fleece was dry, and all the ground was covered with dew. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, having three nations from an alliance against my country may cause me to have some doubts, okay? But Gideon was seriously questioning if God knew what he was doing. At this point, God has already proven that he intended the task to Gideon. He intended for Gideon to do all these great things for the Israelites in God's name with the job of saving Israel. And still, Gideon had to question it. Listen, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. 
And if you're not, in a nutshell, in lamest terms, I'm telling you, I'm encouraging you, I'm asking you that when you know that you know that you know that you know that God is coming to you and he is pulling at you, he is tugging at you, he is telling you, I need you to do this, accept who you are in him and handle that business that he is giving you authority to handle. If you're watching this live, I hope you just typed amen. The Spirit of God has even taken possession of Gideon, as we read in verse 34, gathering all the armies of the people of Israel to prepare for battle. And we still see that Gideon is doubting that God is in control of what's going on or what's going to happen. This is exactly why God is God and we not. Because I, some of us can't be asked one question more than one time. I'm more of a three-strike person. So I get asked the same thing three times, it's a trigger for me. I'm asking God to help me with it. Please pray for me, family. But I'm just saying that's how I am. And this man continuously, continuously, continuously is questioning God. And God's still choosing to use him. God is still choosing to use him. Okay, when God fulfills the task that Gideon asked, we finally see that Gideon is ready to follow God's lead. Once again, Gideon realized that his faith in God was solid. And what a game changer it was for him and his people once he realized that. If you continue to read the story, God takes an army of 32,000 men and whittles them down to an army of only 300 men. Well, Russell, why? I'm going to let you know why. Why did God do that? To prove that the victory was only through his hands and not because of the strength of the people of Israel. Mm. In our eyes, we see 32,000, right? Three, two, comma, zero, 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 okay? And that dwindles down to three, zero, zero, right? Legit, any one of us would be like, that's it, it's over, we lost. What, 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 what is we going to do? We have 32,000, now we only got 300. What is we going to do? Okay, and legit, God said, <laughs> you see a small number, but I see a mighty army. Just stay faithful, let's go. The victory over the nations planning to attack Israel was truly one that only God could have fought. And how many times have we fought battles in our own lives or God has sent us to go fight battles in our lives or on behalf of someone else and we could only do it because of him or we got through it only because of him. The armies that were against Israel were much larger than 300 men the army that Gideon was leading. But through following God's directions, the Israelites were able to have victory without having to do much fighting. What? Okay, just, just a quick rewind, a quick 10-second uh, uh, rewind. Here we go. 32,000 men, 32,000 man army goes down to 300 being led by Gideon. And God says, yo, I got you. Don't worry about it. And then they go into battle with just 300 men and they barely have to fight and win? Listen, some of us got to go to the store and fight over a pork chop right now, okay? So you're sitting there telling me that that's how powerful God is? Yes, yes, that, that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's exactly how powerful God is. Hmm. That's awesome. The Israelites were able to have victory without having to do much fighting. Listen, if you're at home right now, real quick, I'm getting ready to wrap up, but this is not my closing. But if you're at home, you're watching this, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to raise your hands to God. And I want you to say, Father, I receive that in my life. All right, don't worry about the dog. Don't worry about the cat. Okay, matter of fact, pray that over them too. But 
that is amazing that with him, we don't have to worry about that much fighting. And once we apply that to, to our lives, just amazing things take place. Gideon said that he was the weakest man from the weakest family in the weakest tribe. And that's not exactly what we would think coming from one of the greatest judges in the Old Testament. However, Gideon didn't think much of himself. Okay, like we just recap the story of him doing something awesome in God's name. And if you know the book of Judges and the story of Gideon, what I just said, you know that that applies. However, Gideon in the beginning did not think much of himself. In fact, when we first met him, he's actually hiding. I'm sure to some people say, oh man, God let him keep cutting that down so we can get some wine. Hey, oh, come on now, family, stop all that. Let's drop all that. No judgment, I'm just saying. Focus on the main part of it, okay? But he was hiding. He was hiding because he knew what was going on. And again, his outlook of his self was, well, I'm the weakest of the weak, so whatever. He was just trying to get enough food to provide for his family. So I guess that's uh, uh, some encouragement behind that, if you will. But it doesn't hide the fact that he was hiding. And a lot of us can be like that too. Listen, I'm not trying to tear down Gideon. I'm not trying to erase all the good that we ended that part of the story on. But a lot of us can be like that too. And going through life just trying to get by isn't going to cut it. We try not to draw attention to ourselves because we have doubts about what we have to offer in the grand scheme of things. But if we allow God to reach into our lives and say, hey, I have something awesome that I want you to do. What if we didn't respond with, who, me? Answer thinking that God had the wrong address or gotten us confused with someone else. What if we didn't confuse any of that? What would happen if we acknowledge that God knows what he is doing from the beginning? Hmm. My family, my brothers, my sisters, understand that he has called you for a purpose. He wants you to do a great work in his name. And he's already given you the power to do it. We see throughout the Bible that God does not call the ideal person to do a task. And when I say ideal, I mean in the world's eyes, ideal. He's not looking for the most popular or the best dressed or the richest or, or who we think is the most grandest, bestest of it all. I know that was terrible grammar for my English teachers out there. But that's not what he's looking for. He's looking to work through people that do not appear to be perfect. We all have flaws and doubts about ourselves. We tell ourselves that we're not good enough, that we need to change for people to like us or even for God to use us. Hmm. Before we end, there's a two and a half minute video that's gonna come up on your screen. I point up to the screen like you can see that, I'm sorry. But that's gonna come up. It's from BuzzFeed, it's a BuzzFeed video. Two and a half minutes, just watch. I came in not knowing what I was really coming in for. I was brought into a room that had a big mirror in front of me and they asked us questions about first impressions. I just started talking away about my imperfections and what parts of myself I see in the uh, mirror. I, I, I haven't told this to anyone. Just really going over how I viewed myself and how I think others view me. I've definitely struggled with weight issues. I definitely look at people and I'm like, do I look fat today? Is my hair look all right? You always want to have better skin, have a better body. I'm kind of self-conscious of my round face, um, especially like my cheekbones here. He's like in shape, 
He has nice cheeks. He has really nice cheekbones. I feel like he's the life of the party and I'd gravitate towards him. I think I have donkey legs. That's a great body type. I don't know if she realizes how lucky she is. I never really felt like I was manly. I definitely think that he's like masculine. He seems like a cool guy. I've always been self-conscious of my dimples. I really like her smile. She has really cute dimples. She's probably a really fun person. When I look in the mirror, I'm like, do I need to lose weight? I think she's in shape. If she's mean to herself, then that's just kind of one of those weird things where everybody's harsher on themselves. Oh boy, okay. I think she's pretty. He's got a great beard. She has a great smile. He's like really fit. Definitely <laughs> wins people over. I like her hair. Oh. He doesn't say a lot, but when he does say something, it, it means something. That was so crazy. What are your first thoughts? Um, wow. I wasn't really expecting that. <laughs> so no one heard what was going on. No. Cool. I feel a lot better now. It is cool to see somebody else's perspective. The mirror lies, man. I guess, yeah. I don't trust the mirror. Like, people think completely different than, like, what you might think of yourself. We all see what's bad about our own body. We don't actually see what's great. I am stuck in my body till I die, so <laughs> what good is it gonna do if I mean to myself? You're better than who you think you are, and that you're enough just the way you are, so be kinder to yourself. God doesn't see the flaws. More specifically, God doesn't see your flaws. What he sees is the potential that you have if you simply have the faith to follow his directions. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for each and every one of us now, Lord God, those who are watching. Pray for our family members, Lord God. I pray for their family members, Lord God. That we just accept that you know what you are doing. That you have our best interests and that once we just bow humbly to you, Lord God, that we've got the authority and we've got the power. That it doesn't matter how we see ourselves in a negative light because to you, we are the strongest. We are the bravest. We're the most good looking. And you still wanna use us no matter what, Lord. Father, I just pray that each and every one of us can receive that, Lord God, that we can receive the love that you have for us, that we don't try to fight it or talk ourselves out of it, Lord God, that we just run straight to it, Lord God. And Father God, I pray that when you call us to do your will, Lord God, to do your work, Father God, I pray that, that we take encouragement from Gideon, but we learn to not question you, Father God, and we just put all our hope and faith in you. Lord God, bless our family until we meet again and keep everyone safe and sound. In your precious name we pray, amen. Family, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we love you, we miss you. We hope to see you soon. We'll see you Sunday morning. God bless you.